Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. Um, if you're unable to answer them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. There is a handout for this webinar that you are free to download if you'd like. It's in the upper right hand corner of the screen under files. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from Heather Pack, who will be speaking on Getting Millennials Excited About Family History. Heather Ruth Pack became interested in family history at, at the young age of 12. After taking genealogy classes at BYU, she put her research skills to work to find her great-grandfather's true identity. She found him 24 years later, learning many of the tools and tricks of the trade and collecting several hundred stories along the way. Her family history blogs are read by thousands around the world and have been featured on several genealogy sites, inspiring others to go find stories from their own family tree. She is a frequent guest lecturer and a published author. Heather received her master's degree in public administration at BYU in the Marriott School of Management, where she taught communication classes for several years to hundreds of millennials. Currently, she serves as a family search support missionary for the LDS Church. Through the Hi, thank you. I'm so excited today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is millennials, the younger generation. I'd like to begin by um, first talking about a little more about this uh, story that Braden mentioned when I found my great grandfather. So when I was a young child, I found out that my great grandfather, John Buchanan, was a mystery and that our family tree was actually a dead end with him. I decided that I wanted to find out who his parents were and in the process discovered that he actually had run away from home and changed his name. And like Braden mentioned, 24 years later, I was able to find out that his true name was actually Joshua DeMoulin. So this meant that we actually weren't Scottish, we were French. And I had a family windmill out in France. And I thought it would be fun to take my kids to France for the summer. One, hopefully to find the windmill, but also to do some family history search. But really just because I wanted to find out what is it like to be French. It turns out this trip was not as romantic as I thought it would be. Actually, it was pretty hard. One time I decided to go meet a neighbor of mine who was also visiting in Europe in the Netherlands. So I hopped on the train so that I could meet her for lunch. We didn't get very far on our train ride when we actually got kicked off the train because they said our passports had not been verified. We had 10 minutes to run through the town trying to find a station that would verify our passports so that we could get back on the train. And we did with just a few seconds to spare. Another time I was given a notice that there was a letter with a credit card inside waiting for me. As you can imagine, this credit card was pretty important when you're all the way over in France. And it took me three days to find out where the post office was, find out what its hours were, and to figure out a way that I could verify that I actually was um, able to pick up this letter because it was addressed to my husband. I was so frustrated that when I finally got the letter, I took a picture just to show my accomplishment. Living in France is wonderful just for the food. We had baguettes, pan au chocolat, and orangina anytime we wanted. But sometimes we just wanted a burger and fries and a Fanta to remind us of home. Now, even though my kids and I technically weren't immigrants, we did experience many of the traits that immigrants experience when they move to a new country. Getting thrown off that train was frightening, especially because we were in Belgium and we had no idea when another train was coming. I can't imagine how scary it must be to get off of a train in a foreign land knowing that this is now going to be my home forever. And again, that most frustrating experience, all it was was just to pick up a credit card at the post office. How frustrating it must be to land in a foreign country and have to find work, open up a business, and all the other things immigrants must do in order to make a living. If you had told me that while I was in France, I would be nostalgic for America, I would have said, you're crazy. I found that I was missing home in just a few days, and I knew that I'd get to live back in America again and just by the end of the summer. So my question for you is, are you an immigrant? 
Well, even if you are living in the same country where you were born, there's a chance you might just be. You might not be an immigrant to a new country, but you might be an immigrant to the digital revolution, also known as the third industrial revolution. As an immigrant to the digital technology, it's easy to experience some of those same emotions that a traditional immigrant will feel. Whenever a new product comes out, we can be afraid to use it, or we can be nostalgic for how it used to be, or we can be frustrated in trying to learn how to use whatever new gadget or new technology comes our way. To get a better sense of whether we are an immigrant or not, let's compare as to how an immigrant is to a native. So when you look at digital immigrants and digital natives, typically immigrants are born before 1980, whereas natives typically are born after 1980. As immigrants, we aren't raised with the widespread use of technology. We remember what things were like um, before all these new gadgets and all these ways to communicate came about. Whereas digital natives, this is pretty much all they've ever known. The internet has been a part of their life since they were first born. We, as immigrants, then will speak with an accent. We aren't um, as fluent in using the technology as natives, whereas they are considered to speak fluently in this technology. But hopefully, none of us, whether an immigrant or a native, are known as a digital Luddite. To help you understand a little better what a digital Luddite is, I want to share a quick story of um, what it was like during the first Industrial Revolution. In a little village in Nottingham in England, their industry was to weave socks, and it would take about a week to get one pair of socks woven. And this um, skill would take years to learn. With the Industrial Revolution came this new fangled device called a loom. And now, within just a few minutes, anyone who was skilled or unskilled could weave a pair of socks. This village was very scared of what this was going to do to their industry. So, headed by a man named Ludd, they came up with this brilliant idea that they were going to go and destroy the loom. And together they came and with their tools, and um, pitchforks, I imagine all these lanterns around them, they destroyed this loom. Well, as we know, 250 years later, their tactic didn't work. At last I know, my socks weren't created in Nottingham by a bunch of little weavers in a village. So we don't want to um, resist the technology as it comes. We want to embrace it. And one of the ways that we can do this is by better understanding these digital natives Commonly, in today's vernacular, they're known as millennials, or those who are born in the millennial generation. Now, many of their traits um, are more of a general speaking. Some of them you, that you know may not have these traits. These tend to be more across the board. Um, and I see these as strengths. They could be construed as weaknesses, but I think if we leverage them correctly, they definitely are the strengths that this generation brings. First trait that I'd like to mention is that they value freedom. They want freedom in everything that they do. They, in, they especially want freedom of choice and freedom of expression. They see the world as a level playing field, and this is largely due in part to the internet. The internet equalizes everyone. So they don't see people in terms of hierarchy, which also um, can make it difficult for them to understand or appreciate a family tree. They value relationships. They like to collaborate and work with others. I found that when I taught um, at a university, many of my students were always looking for those team assignments versus those individual work assignments because they tend to really like to work as a team or work with other people. And going along with that, they like to participate in the learning process one thing that you'll notice is encyclopedias pretty much are a thing of a past, but Wikipedia is ever increasingly popular. And one of the reasons why is this is an opportunity for those to expand their knowledge base by collaborating with others and participating in learning and discovering new things. So I think an encyclopedia versus a Wikipedia is a great example of the differences in this generation. 
Also, they are what are known as intuitive learners. They love to learn by discovering the information for themselves. Now, my generation tends to be known as linear learners. This means that they receive their, um, linear learners receive their information by another source in order, and they don't get to choose how this information is received. The one giving the information gets to decide. So just imagine reading a book. When I was young and I had to do a book report, I would go to the library, pick down, pick up a book from the shelf, and the book determined how I was going to gain this information, and then I would write my report. This is very frustrating to millennials. They want to be able to go out and find this information for themselves and not be told in what order or how they should learn the information. They also are incredible, innovative thinkers. I've had an opportunity to judge um, a few student competitions where the students will present what ideas they have to solve current world problems. One such competition was with some physicists and engineers. I was absolutely blown away with the type of solutions that they come up with, with problems that are existing today. I am very hopeful and encouraged for the future. If these are the kind of ideas they're thinking of at such a young age, I think we're in for some really great, um, incredible and effective solutions for tomorrow. And going along with that freedom of choice, millennials like to be able to customize their information and make it personal to them. So just imagine when you pick up a book off the library shelf, someone else has decided what size the font is, what kind of font it is, how many pages are in the book, what size the pages, what color the pages. Well, not so in today's world. Now we can choose what size font we want, how we want it to look. We can choose the size of the tablet, um, what, whether we want the screen to be black on white, white on black, sepia, or multiple other colors. And so this is um, where they are most comfortable receiving their information is in a customized manner. Another trait that they have is the need for speed. I read about a study once that millennials, um, they were watching to see how many times they'll change the screen on their device. and it, got up to 27 times in an hour. I can't even imagine looking at 27 screens in an hour, but this is very comfortable and normal for them. Because of this desire and this need to change quickly, get new information, they are finding that they tend to have a shorter attention span. And millennials love fun. They love entertainment. Um, whether it's at play, at work, or at school, or at home, this is a, a very playful generation, very lighthearted. My husband went to visit a potential investor one day, and it was this large three-story building, and the, the owner had created a slide that curled from the top of the third floor down to the bottom so that the employees to get to their car at night would just slide down this big, long, curly slide instead of taking a boring old elevator. And um, and so I, I think it's fun to watch the ways that they incorporate entertainment into all aspects of their life. So the question is, do millennials need to know their family history? If they're so unique, if they're so different, does the past even matter? Does it matter that they know who these um, ancestors are and what their lives were like? Well, obviously, I feel like the answer is yes, or else I wouldn't be here today. But beyond just saying yes, I'd like to submit to you that it is now more important than ever before that this generation understands their family history and knows their past. So to gain a better understanding of how I've come to this conclusion, I'd like to share with you a study that was done in the summer of 2001. Um, and I got this, I learned about this study in the New York Times. It was published on March 15, 2013 by Bruce Failer. It's called The Stories That Bind Us. In the summer of 2001, there was a group of um, social scientists, psychologists, that decided they wanted to study the effects that family history has on a group of children. So they came up with 20 very general questions about family history. And they asked them things like, where did your grandfather go to high school? When did your parents get married? Where did they get married? Just real basic kind of questions like that. After interviewing all of these children, they were able to divide them into two different groups. 
one who had a basic understanding of their family history and those who didn't. And then something incredible happened, and that was 9-11. This was an event that affected all of the children, affected children all over the nation. Very scary terrorist attack. And um, what they decided to do was then follow these kids and see how one group reacted to 9-11 versus the other. And what they found was that those who knew the answers to those family history questions it um, tended to have stronger emotional health and happiness, more resiliency, and lower stress. So what they decided based on 9-11, knowing the family history, and studying these children, this was the main takeaway that they had. If you want a happier family, create, refine, and retell the story of your family's positive moments and your ability to bounce back from the difficult ones. So it's not just these family stories are nice to know or it's fun to know. It is important to know because it helps them as they move on in their future and especially as they face challenging and stressful times. But here's the problem. These amazing stories that are going to help these millennials get through life are trapped in these books. I took a picture of um, the, some of the family history books I have in my own home. And if, I, if my kids were to come home and see them laying on the table and I were to say, OK, I want you to sit down and read these books, they would say, why are you punishing me? What have I had done wrong? They don't want to sit, like we've discussed with their traits, they don't want to sit and read a big, thick, dusty book full of um, stories about their ancestors. So how do we solve this problem? How do we handle these stories that are trapped inside these books? Well, some people have come up with the idea that they're going to stick $100 bills in these books before they send them out to their grandchildren. And um, I, when I give this presentation to young groups, I always say, if you ever receive a thick book from an ancestor, shake the binder, shake the book, because there might be some money that falls out. But I fortunately have come up with a solution that is much less expensive than putting $100 bills in a bunch of family history books, and I also think is going to be far more effective. So as I've um, experimented and tried telling different stories to younger generation, some of the elements that I have found is, one, it's helpful if the story has some humor in it. Now, I recognize that there are some very serious and tragic stories when it comes to our ancestors, even in our own lives. And I don't, I'm not recommending to downplay or make light of these horrible situations, but sometimes that can be an emotional drain for the audience to hear. And if, if appropriate, it's good to break up that emotional journey with some little bit element, some little bit of humor, some elements of fun in the story. It helps if the story is engaging. And by engaging, I mean it's compelling. It's told in such a way that they want to know how it ends. They want to know what happens. It's also helpful when, um, if it's electronic. We talked about how they like to be able to customize their information. They want to be able to discover it for themselves. And so an electronic version of the story can be more accessible to a millennial. They also, because of their short attention span and um, the fact that they like to change screens quickly, it helps if there's visual elements in the story, if it's not just pure text. That's one of the reasons why Diary of a Wimpy Kid is so popular, is because it's a book full of pictures. Um, again, going along that same theme, it's helpful if the stories are short. It can be overwhelming to hear about an ancestor from the time they were born until they died all in one setting. But if you can break up that person's life into short little manageable stories, it can be more fun and interesting to the millennial. It also helps if there's some kind of a personal connection. And this is something I try to do with several of my stories, is relate something that happened in the past to something that's happening now so they can personalize it and feel like this ancestor could relate to them. So what I'd like to do now is just share with you some examples of ways that we can um, use these elements. And not every system and not every way that we share our stories need to incorporate all six of those. But if you can at least get one of them, you'll probably see some more success. So 
About four years ago, I decided I wanted to host a large family gathering that would honor my grandfather on what would have been his 100th birthday. Now, I knew that there was no way we were going to be able to get all of these small little young great-grandchildren to sit still while the, quote, old folks told story after story about this man that these young children had never met. And so as I thought about it, I decided I'm going to create a blog so that those who want to can log on and, and, and post stories about their grandfather, and then anybody who wants to can read them. It also was a great way for me to give directions and information about the party. Well, from that real simple little idea was born my blog, which is now called A Certain Englishman's Wife. And since that time, I have written hundreds of stories about my ancestors, and I've been surprised to discover it's being read by thousands of people, including those who've never even met my ancestors or aren't even related to them. So I just want to share with you just real quickly some of the kind of stories that I have written on the blog. One story came because my kids simply asked, Mom, what, were you, what did you do when you were a teenager? And I was embarrassed to admit I spent a lot of my teenage years hanging out at the mall. So I decided to turn that into a story and I just showed, I walked through the mall with um, my kids in this story, letting them know about all the different stores and all the different things we used to do at the mall. And this became widely popular among others who grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, because it brought back stories of when they used to hang out at the Mesilla Valley Mall as well. I found a story on the internet once about one of my ancestors who was beheaded by the king because he refused to join the Church of England. And apparently he said, the king can go to the devil. And I thought that was such a funny little phrase that I decided to create a short little story about my ancestor. And many people have discovered that they too come from this same ancestor and have appreciated finding out this little story about him telling the king he can go to the devil. I also will write stories about people who I knew personally but have now since passed on. This story is a funny little confession that I made right before um, they closed my mother's casket. And, and I wanted to tell these funny stories, especially for my future grandchildren who were never going to get to meet my mom, and so I wanted to have stories about her so they could feel like they knew her too. Now, because it's a blog, Luckily, I don't have to um, just write stories. I can do lots of different things. I can do videos. I can have sound. And one day I decided that for my husband's birthday, I would actually create what's known as an infographic, giving just small little bits of piece of information about my husband in honor of his birthday. I really like blogs because they're so flexible. And there's so much I can do with them. And they're free. It doesn't cost me anything to to post or to write anything on my blog. But if in the future I want to, I can publish a book with all of these stories into one place. But for now, I like keeping it on this blog because anybody who just does a Google search looking for one of their ancestors can stumble upon one of my stories about an ancestor that we share. Another way that you can share your family history with the millennials is through Twitter or through Instagram. You can create an account set aside just to share moments about your family's history. You could use one of their journals and pretend that you are that ancestor and tweet as if that ancestor had had Twitter all those, all those years ago. Another thing you could do is create an account that shows what was happening on this very day within your family history. Like, today was the day my great-grandparents got married, and then that connects it to what was the weather probably like, or what it was that time of year, and just makes it short, sweet, and, and simple, and easy to connect to. Just recently, the LDS Church has asked that in honor of Easter, we tweet pictures of those who are um, in our loved ones who have since passed on that we would like to see again and to use the hashtag hallelujah. So I picked two of my craziest ancestors. They have such funny stories and I, and I share how I would like to meet them someday using the hashtag provided for this um, Easter campaign. One of the nice things about using Twitter or Instagram or those kind of social media is it's a way to grab the millennials' um, attention as they're flipping through screens quickly. Um, if this pops up in their news feed, they can very quickly read the story and, and then move on with the rest of their feed. 
Another um, idea that I really like is using Facebook. I have a friend who really uses Facebook to share with her loved ones stories about her ancestors. This particular post, um, she talks about how her great granddaughter's name connects her to an ancestor from 1561. And I thought, what a fun way to make that personal to that great granddaughter. Another thing that Facebook allows is when you do share a story, it allows members from around the country, around the world to join in the conversation. They can ask questions, they can share their own memories, and it's almost like you're sitting around a virtual dinner table talking about grandma and grandpa. So some aren't probably comfortable with social media or maybe don't want things that they have about their family posted on the internet. But there's other solutions as well. One of the things you can do is at a family reunion or a family gathering, you can create some kind of a game or a quiz that would encourage the younger generation to interview the older generation to find out information. You could also make games out of the pictures of your ancestors. I saw a really clever idea where you take the pictures of your ancestors and you turn them into playing cards. Then you could get all the kids to gather around the table to play Go Fish. But instead of saying, do you have any eights? They would say, do you have any Grandpa Joes? Another fun thing comes from a, a friend of mine. She has been attending a family reunion that their family holds. I think since the 1940s, so close to 70 years. Well, as you can imagine, as each generation comes, there's um, lots of opportunities to teach them about the people from the past. The way that they do it is by putting on silly skits and funny songs where everyone can join in and participate to understand the family better. Another great resource is by using FamilySearch.org. Right now that they have um, an opportunity called Keepsakes, and the link to this web page on their website will be available in the handout. But what they've created is some real beautiful artwork that you can print and share with your family using information from your family tree. Another thing that they have is called the My Family Booklet. And what this does is it gives you an opportunity to write down different memories you have about different ancestors, and then it creates a 32-page PDF that you can print out and share with your family. Something else that I found on Family Search that I thought was really interesting is they have taken the Overland Trail database and have searched through They'll search through your family tree and pull out your ancestors who are a hit on this database. And now I can easily see what company they came with, but also I can see what stories people have told about that journey called the trail stories. And if I need to, I can also look to see how I'm related to these people on my family tree. Some other ideas that um, could be used to help share family stories to the millennials is by writing an ebook. This is something that you don't have to charge anyone to download the book. You can make it free, but it's essentially like pictures of a book or a PDF, and there's lots of websites and resources available so that if you want to write a book, you can um, post it on Amazon or some other places, and then anybody who wants to can download the book for free to read it. Dropbox or other websites where you can share files is a place where you could have a bunch of family photos available and then anyone who um, you share that folder with can look at those photos anytime they want or if they need them for a project. Another place is Google Docs and it, that could serve almost like a Wikipedia for your own family where you just create a doc and everyone who can think of stories or information about an ancestor can all share them in one place so that it's accessible to everyone. Birthdays and Christmas gifts, or birthdays and Christmas is a great time to give gifts where you can share the My Family booklet or some of those printable artwork or even just a token or a memory of one of the ancestors through poetry or through a story. And I have found some of the easiest ways and most effective ways to share family history is just in the everyday conversations that you have with the younger generation. Sometimes I'll see one of my kids do something and I'll say, you know what, my Nona, which, who was my Italian grandmother, she used to do the exact same thing. You remind me so much of Nona.
And it's just a way to personalize and um, bring those people to life for the young people. And all of these ideas and links will be available in the handout so you can get more information. Well, I, I hope that this webinar has given you some ideas of how you can share your own stories with your loved ones. I know that every family is unique. Everybody has their own set of stories. And so some of these ideas might not work for your particular family, but I encourage you to experiment. Find out what works best for you so that each generation can carry on the stories that you have in your um, family history for today. Thank you so much for watching this webinar. Thank you, Heather, for a wonderful webinar today. Um, for those that are watching, feel free to download the handout under the Files tab in the top right corner of the screen. Um, this webinar will be made available afterwards on the BYU Family History Library website at the link on the bottom um, and also on YouTube later on. Um, thank you very much.